Uh, good afternoon. Sorry for the delay. I was supposed to be in the other room earlier, but had to move over here very quickly. Um, I'm Carl Cotton. I'm here from Washington, D.C., uh, talking about incorporating user experience in your projects uh, as part of the challenge I know often working on technical Drupal teams. Um, why user experience is important? Uh, basically, Nielsen Norman Group is one of the leading UX design firms in the world, and uh, I think they sum it up very well here about that it encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction. And of course, what that comes down to for us is making sure that we make the user the center of the products and not the technical requirements when we're working on a project. About me, I started out in visual design, print and branding. Um, since it moved into web design, information architecture and content strategy, and now do Drupal site building, architecture, and also help organize Drupal events in the area, including GovCon and just attended DrupalCon Baltimore. Um, as I had mentioned before, of course, I mean, when it comes down to uh, just this all-encompassing aspect, since what we're providing, of course, through our web products or services, if we're not effectively meeting the needs of our users, uh, what exactly are we achieving? Um, as far as the value proposition, if we do align UX uh, with our organizational goals, it enhances our ability to fulfill our mission, enables users to quickly achieve their goals, empowers greater community engagement. Uh, one of the, also one of the larger misconceptions that we often get in the field is the difference between user experience and user interface. I think a good analogy is food. If we start out with content, which what you have is a raw material or what we talk about for content strategy, then you have the user interface, which is basically the tools you use to access that content and work with that content. That brings you down to user experience. And just a web experience, just like going out to a restaurant, a lot of that is the atmosphere that's created. And that's why all these aspects, oftentimes, that, are, that can be left to the side if we're just looking at requirements, can be left out. Um, as far as going into more of the uh, definition of what user experience is and how it's not user interface, this is everything that basically comes down to a long list of what user experience encompasses. Most of the time when we're looking at user interface, it's only the end product that we're dealing with. When it comes down to interface design and visual design, it, it, it kind of leaves out a lot of what's done on the back end that actually comes out to get you to this final stage. Uh, of course, there are a number of roles, and just to make sure that it's just not UI design. As far as uh, user experience impacting user, uh, user interface impacting user experience in the real world, I'll bring it back in aviation examples, since I do come from a military aviation background. Uh, this is a World War II era aircraft, this is Boeing B-17. Part of the problem is, when coming back, is, uh, as far as the interface was concerned, uh, there were a number of crashes that were happening because the controls were basically grouped very closely together as being similar, even though they had different tasks. Here we had landing lights and a wing flap control so close together, and of course, coming down to our affordances, part of the challenge was, of course, because these tasks were so different but grouped together, and there was no tactile difference and impossible to tell by touch. Uh, it was only through a lot of sad experience that a lot of that happened. Uh, just coming up here, of course, and uh, this, is an, uh, this is a landmark case study when it comes down to user interface design and some of the problems that happened. Aviation, of course, because of the high risks that are involved in it, was one of the best fields to actually start out in making user uh, experience design uh, a major factor in design. Of course, a lot of this could have come out through a lot of basic uh, user research and iteration. As far as moving up a few decades, here we've got one of the most popular airliners in use today, another Boeing product, 737. Here, of course, with a modern cockpit, a lot of the functions are still the same, even though the aircraft is more advanced. How things got fixed here? The same controls that I had listed before, the lights are now all grouped up with the other lights. Flap control is still there, but also coming in for affordances. Besides grouping the controls together, also are tactile differences. You don't even have to look at this or read any labeling or, or to make sure that what you're doing is actually a different process and that you need to pay attention to it. As far as the takeaways are concerned, um, this is one of the challenges you often come out here for user uh, experience design. Even if you have a lot of users that may be very technically advanced, oftentimes there may be some other issues. Say, for example, your attention is being diverted uh, when accomplishing a task and it's easy to forget what you need to do. This is especially important at times when looking at the back-end interfaces that site admins may need to work on on a Drupal project. Uh, designers often didn't pay enough attention to the human factor. This is often left out, especially on deadlines. I'm sure we're all responsible for that at one point or another. And it could have been avoided by tailoring to the human factor. 
uh, looking at a way to guide better decisions. Again, the affordances, and of course on a web interface on a screen, it's a little bit different, but it still can, some of the same principles still apply. Uh, this is one thing that comes down to challenging web UX, and granted this looks like something out of the 1990s, but this comes out to patient information, and this is the way a lot of this information is still presented in US hospitals. And you see that it's still troublingly prevalent. Right there for that arrow that's indicating, that actually is an alert to some of the medical team that was caring for this patient that there was a major health interaction they needed to watch out for. Of course, with nurses being busy with the number of patients that they had to be taken care of, that was easily overlooked. And if that high load and this poor UX design uh, resulted in the patient dying needlessly. I, we contrast that with an excellent web UX. This is for MailChimp for their back-end interface for managing a mail campaign. Here we also see, of course, the different designs, whether it's here for desktop and here for mobile. Layouts are balanced, even though there's a lot of information that's being covered here. You can still see that it's broken down into elements that are easily digestible. There's a good content hierarchy. If you want to drill down and look at some of this, you can click on it, but it's not all being presented at one time. And also, as far as uh, building out here for good responsive design, you can see here that the mobile experience isn't broken. Even though it's set up for a smaller screen and a hand interface, all the information you have over in the desktop here is still also in mobile. It's just that it's in a better format now, and especially for adjusting for finger tap. What it means for us is, of course, is that usually these uh, challenges don't really require a lot of revolutionary technology. Uh, it's going out here through empathy, by, basically by working out with user testing and iteration to get to that common goal. And as with the UI improvements, it often is minimal technological development. Um, I'll suggest in the inside of my process I'll get to then is that uh, uh, just basically iteration and prototyping help avoid a lot of this, getting something into the hands of your users as quickly as possible. I'll go over briefly on the principles of UX. Uh, basically, Peter Morville comes out here, and because the field is so broad, he basically breaks it down into a few questions. Is your product useful? Is it usable? Is it desirable? Is it findable? Is it accessible? Is it credible? Is it valuable? I go into a little bit more detail on this. As far as something is useful, this is often something I've worked on even for some of my larger Drupal projects coming in here. Of course, even on government and large institutional products, there may be a number of different requirements we have to work with. There may be some sort of government requirements, also when it comes down to projects and time. Sometimes we have to advocate for our users and make sure that we're actually covering for their use cases instead of just the requirements. Also, when it comes down to usability, as in some of the examples I'd cited earlier, this can often be a challenge uh, coming in here and trying to cram out a lot of functionality, but actually have something that, can, that users can uh, actually use to complete their task. Is it desirable? Granted, of course, for a lot of applications, including backend, it's not like we're going out here and marketing to actually have a product that may be uh, rocketing to the top of its uh, market uh, uh, placement. But the challenge, of course, is people actually have to like something and, it, that it, and feel that it will accomplish your task, even if it's just for day-to-day -day work. Is it findable? This is often a big thing on web, especially when it comes down to SEO and marketing. And even if you're on the right site, Part of the challenges is can you find the information and the task you need to complete the work you need to do. I think this is oftentimes where it comes down to prototyping and a lot of paper testing, even before any code is written, can find out a lot of these issues. Is it accessible? I know that there was a talk yesterday about upcoming uh, requirements here in the EU. Of course, over in the US and in the Washington area, with a lot of federal requirements are similar. And uh, one of the challenges is talked about too is Every one of us will have some sort of an accessibility issue at some time in our life. Say you're very busy with a project, you're pressed for time, there may be some issues, of course, with bandwidth or so. These are all examples of some type of a, of a disability and accessibility function that we may have to deal with, and it's one thing we should account for. Is it credible? Especially now with a lot of fake news and dark UX and UI patterns coming out here, we have to look out here and are we providing something that users can actually believe in? And is it valuable? Of course, the main thing, of course, going out here and selling web products and services, are we actually meeting our minimum viable product? Are we helping our client and our users meet their goals? As far as the process is concerned, I'll go out and say that um, I've helped also with other organizations build their processes. I never take anything as dogma. 
Um, one of the things that I find that acts work, works quite well is uh, Stanford and Ideas Design Thinking Framework. I kind of adapt this as needed to a project. And like I said, don't go ahead and take it as exactly what it needs. It just needs to be adapted for your use and for every client project since every one is a little bit different. They basically break it down into four segments. They're basically coming down and asking what is. That's when you're coming out here and doing a lot of your discovery. Just finding out exactly what your needs are, what your users' needs are, how they feel about the project. Uh, what if. This is for looking out and exploring a wide number of possibilities. Uh, looking out here, not really throwing anything out at this point. Sometimes even some of the most wild off offbeat issues may, uh, that you come up with may actually solve a problem that may have seemed intractable before. What wows. That's when you're coming out here, and I think it's good to have client and stakeholder involvement at this point. Coming out here in this prototyping phrase, phase, coming out here and looking what actually can work, what the possibilities are, and also looking at requirements, if possible. Seeing what works. This is you're coming out here and actually having workable prototypes, maybe your version 1.0 beta, that you can come out and iterate and build upon. Going into a little bit of further detail, I think one of some of the main things, and it took me a while to wrap my head around this too, but basically asking a lot of questions. That's why it's good, and I think, to spend a lot of time in discovery. And it's good also when you have a number of members of your team, including your development and business development uh, staff, working on a project as well, having direct involvement with the client, because it breaks down a lot of arguments that come in here that people can see, even from a development standpoint, what users are facing and what problems they may have. As far as visualizing, um, I think this is often coming out here and doing a lot of sketching. That's why at this stage when I'm working on a project, I would say even a lot of paper or whiteboard work can actually save a lot of time before anything gets in the code. You can also get clients in, and I think that's one of the things about breaking down a barrier is if you can have them maybe even coming in here and drawing with you on paper or whether a whiteboard, figure out a lot of issues. It helps you getting buy-in at later stages of your project. Uh, what wows. This is also good, I think, coming out here or coming into high fidelity mocks. And be, because of working with different team members, and especially if you have distributed teams, which are on some of my projects, and I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure on many of yours, it helps when you're getting different people and different skill sets and ideas to come together on this. Uh, finding then what works, I think that's just coming down to getting out here when the solution is more refined looking out here and seeing what you need to come back to. Do you need to do some more research? Is what you have right now workable? Can you push it forward? As far as the takeaways are concerned, it's good to solve a lot of problems that you may not have uh, that a linear process if you're trying to push things through, may not find for you. I think it allows for a lot of UX design on a budget, especially if you don't have enough time for doing stakeholder interviews and research. Uh, maybe you're only finding a few key personas to work with. It focuses on qualitative versus quantitative. So you can actually, instead of going very broad but shallow, you're looking at a little bit of a narrow but deep. Basic requirements are lower barriers to entry. Instead of spending a lot of money on, on formalized research, and I think what, especially for me, is imposing a rapid time frame forces you to generate ideas and solutions quickly. And as I had mentioned, don't approach it as a dogma, just adapt it as it fits. And it's only to start. It's not a substitute for formal UX design, but if you, it's the only option available, it's good, especially for smaller projects. Uh, this is an example of something now. It looks a little bit cute about this up here, but it was something we worked on for a global service jam back in 2016. This is something that happens around the world. And it's just a demonstration of a design thinking process as a solution to some of the challenges that we were faced with. We're building together on a team. When you're working on something like a global service jam, you're put together on a team with people you've never met, you've never worked with before. You have about 48 hours to go out here and get a project together. A lot of this short research, and that actually is going out in the field, and here we were in suburban Washington talking to people on the street, getting their uh, impressions on what they would do about water conservation, which was a challenge we needed to work with. I went ahead and I mocked some of this up to make it look a little bit interesting and gamified later on. But all the framework we had, we put together and tested on these paper prototypes in a 48-hour time frame. It just shows, I think, that you can actually get things together in a short amount of time, shorter than you may believe. This is sort of what I do for my modified process. I just go ahead and keep it up here to the five steps. Looking discovery phase, again, is about coming at the interviews. Looking at to find the actual goal, which is often difficult from your client, and that's why I think that good stakeholder interviews are key. Even for some of the leading studios in the DC area, they normally recommend to have two people. One that's skilled in asking questions, and another taking the notes. 
If you're doing both of it, it's extremely difficult at times because what you're doing is you're missing out on a lot of the nonverbal communication that's happening and it's important to record when you're getting user interviews. Gathering requirements, of course, securing buy-in from key stakeholders, and coming into personas. As I'd mentioned in the design thinking process, as long as you have some type of a rough guide to understand based on your research that you have somebody you can advocate for, it makes a lot of the rest of the processes easy to fix. As far as the tool set are concerned, I like to keep things simple and open at this point. I have my own questionnaires that I work on refine for a product, but the thing is, is most of it is to keep it on paper. And if you're, uh, if, you're, if you're allowed to do so, even to have interviewing aides and recorders to help get some of this information you may have missed during the first pass. Going on to the next stage in iteration, that's when a lot of your research is going to be, require, uh, or is going to be built into your prototype. Again, I'll stress again is to use low fidelity tools that allow you to rapidly test the ideas. Sprints are excellent methods to generate ideas. If you're using something like the Agile process, it's good to incorporate something into this and also keep it to a short time frame to make sure that you're getting things out quickly. And if you're at all possible, it's to involve stakeholders. I find that even when working on major web projects, say where I am right now at a major financial concern, even having paper prototypes in front of people can answer a lot of questions that your stakeholders may not have thought of. Again, I still keep this into different paper templates. I went ahead and generated this after years of experience, but coming up here, just making sure that we're sketching out, especially for responsive design, going out here for user flows and storyboards, just going out here that you have something you can actually put together and clarify a lot of your ideas on. Going into the build process, that's when I incorporate the best ideas into the product. Also look at testing as much as possible. Gorilla UX, I know oftentimes on short time frames, it's impossible to go out here and do formalized testing. If you have to test it with family members, colleagues, uh, even as far as you can get onto your clients uh, when you're allowed to do so, it's good to have random testing at this point to see how it's working in the real world. Um, of course, with Drupal, I think this is also a good advantage as, as, as much as you can is to make your systems, including your visual design, as modular as possible so you can modify if need be. And again, if major issues are discovered, to go back and iterate. As far as the tool sets are concerned, that's when I'm moving things in the code. Once I get to this stage, I'd like to put things into Drupal as much as possible, going out here and of course, I mean, on a larger frameworks that we're working on, uh, normally, of course, posting this up to GitHub doing pull requests, making sure that we have things out here that we can test and put in the hands of people as quickly as possible. Just make sure also that if you can be doing device testing at this point, to be able to do so. Brings it back to the review stage. This is where we're coming into functional testing. Looking, of course, is your product performing as you expect it to? Um, getting it out in the users as quickly as possible to gauge effectiveness and security. Uh, this is something I cannot emphasize enough. I've worked on Drupal projects, some of them were for federal clients. Um, yes, a lot of the requirements may have come out and they were okay once the product had been pushed live. One of the things that did not get checked though is when it came down to security. And here in one of the projects we had, it came down to a Drupal views display. Uh, this project was uh, basically serving a, a lot of women who were in a kind of dire life situations in the United States. Um, they had a lot of information that should not have been public because it was allowing them to help with different providers. The problem was one of these uh, clients went ahead and did a Google search of herself on the public internet, found a lot of information that should never have been out there. What it came down to is there was no real functional testing on security when it came down to this view display, that it shouldn't have been allowed for anonymous users to see this information. That's why I think it's good to go ahead and look at that and make sure that that's one of your top requirements. And again, if major issues like that are discovered, that's when you're going back and redoing what you need to do. Again, most of what we're doing already at this point is gonna be Drupal if you're going out here using any type of accessibility tools going out here and testing for different environments as much as you can. As far as deployment are concerned, once you've met these requirements, that's when you're coming in for a launch. Again, looking as much to users as possible, testing as much as possible. I know there's often something that can be left aside even when pushed wild. And again, look back as far as your reviews are concerned to what you need to get out. As far as that, the tools are still the same. Um, when possible, if allowed to do so, and I know, of course, with a lot of requirements now changing, Google Analytics is good for this. Granted, you don't find everything out for that, but it's a quick way to go out ahead and get a good pulse on your project to see how people are interacting, checking out for user flows. 
And I'll also stress that the process doesn't stop here. It's just basically is to look into a model of continual improvement. As far as the project example was concerned, uh, this was also a conference site that I had worked on. This was a D7 project. Uh, this was for UZ UXPA International 2016. As far as part of the challenges on this project, we needed to build it up from the ground up in Drupal. It required custom coding and interact with the main site, which is also D7, but had a lot of customization and some fragile code, and one of the most complex user models I've ever seen. Um, have, we had a demanding UX-centric user base, and due to prior experience, no printed program would be used, sort of like the change I had to this uh, session right here. And we needed to have a careful balance of performance and features, since a lot of people would be uh, accessing the site on a hotel Wi-Fi, which, which oftentimes would be oversubscribed and limited. Uh, this uh, is the finished product here we're looking at here. Got it up here in desktop and tablet and mobile. As I had shown in some of the prior examples, like with MailChimp, we wanted to make sure that even though most users would be accessing mobile, this wasn't going to be a broken experience for them. Made sure as far as performance was concerned, we we're accounting for art directed and cropped uh, breakpoint images, making sure that the designs worked as well in that responsive format as they did in a full desktop. Um, this is part of where I'll take a lot of time to be working on this and coming into user experience. Going out here and mapping out the user flow. It does take a little bit of time to go out here and do this for a project, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a good investment of time, especially when it comes to how you're building the back end in your site architecture. As far as that also is mapping out the data flow, because we had complexity and we were going out here be between the main uh, organization site, the conference site, and a third party payment processor, there was a lot of complexity we needed to account for. And since it was basically only a two person team who would be putting the site together, me and a back end developer, we needed to make sure that we were on a common understanding from the very outset. Site architecture, this is often something that I've noticed on projects, even for some like a 20,000 plus page website that often gets left to the side. Um, it also, what I find good about this is it settles a lot of arguments, especially the what's going to be fitting up here in the main navigation versus what can be moved to the footer. And for some of this, especially for a conference, as the needs of it change depending on the date to when you're coming to the conference and then post-conference, what is going to need to be there and what can be left, say like a volunteer submission or even for session submissions. As I went into my process, started out here on paper as I had shown before, managed to answer a lot of questions coming out here, even sharing this with other members of the team. This is where I come out here at low fidelity comping. And I think this is oftentimes where I've noticed even on high paid client projects where things can get, uh, get a little bit uh, off the rails. What will happen is oftentimes that web design firms want things to look good. So we'll go out here and have a high fidelity comp versus a wireframe. I'm making sure here that I'm showing, of course, for content strategy, how an application is going to be laid out. Also a lot of annotations. Granted, this does take some time, but I think it saves a lot of trouble, especially when things get really into production and get hectic. Um, coming into the design aspects, uh, one of the things I often use for getting client buy-in, uh, over on the left-hand side, this is a style tile. Uh, Samantha Warren had developed this uh, when she was at phase two. Uh, part of it uh, out is here, you can see that things are a little bit different here. This was an earlier iteration, how the site was looking. Uh, but just going out here, sharing this with the team to go out here and see how colors are going to interact, how a lot of, say, the marketing getting the feel of the product down, looking at basic typography and accessibility when it came to button states and so. This also on the, is a medium fidelity comp. No code has been written at this point, just, to, just basically looking at getting the main layout of the site down and functionality. When it came down to interactive mocks, this is also before any code is done. What I often use is Envision. Here what we're doing out here is actually having a working bitmap prototype that enough of the team users and even for some of our user sample could go out here and test. Here you had working navigation. Even though a lot of this was dummy copy, we actually could show what improvements we were going to be making to the conference program over prior uh, examples of UXPA conferences to make sure that what we were doing, if we were having all the information and what could be left out to give users a good experience but not broken. This was one of the biggest challenges on the product as well, is uh, coming out here in table design. I've worked with conferences for most of my career. They had probably the most complex uh, pricing scheme I had ever seen. And when it came down to response to design, this was also a challenge. Had to find a number of different frameworks to actually display tabular data correct. This is all right now in live code at this stage. 
And uh, what I did is I used Zurb responsive tables here, modified for Drupal. You can see here that even though this is mobile, all the information that's here is displayed properly. Also adding some affordances when it comes down to this, showing users that, uh, very subtly that they could be swiping to go out here and see this information. Since this is all done through JavaScript and is left out on the desktop, making sure that that same information would be displayed and readable and that people could access it easily. Form design is another thing, especially on Drupal sites. And when it comes down to a lot of e-commerce, this is oftentimes which can lead to card abandonment. Granted, when we were using uh, some of the existing contrib frameworks out here, like Drupal Commerce, it usually isn't styled very well. All I'm doing right here, this is all being done through CSS, is improving a lot of the access, making things more clear, styling things that they're grouped properly, and especially when it comes down to mobile, is making sure instead of, say, having a standard HTML checkboxes and radio buttons, having something that actually would account for tap area for large fingers. Uh, came down to program UX, also going through stock Drupal, basically coming out here for tab view displays, working at something that could work on mobile, since that's how most people would be accessing this information during the conference, having it all be sortable, including when it came down to conference layouts. Again, for performance, we went through and did a lot of redrawing uh, for these to be SVG images that would be resolution independent and still working at desktop, conveying all the same information. Uh, staff is another challenge when I find out here and often left by the wayside. Since we wouldn't have time to answer a lot of questions, needed to have a lot of this information that would be displaying properly and for a lot of staff to be accessing it, even if they're not that technically advanced. As far as the takeaways are concerned, uh, we found the registration was up. We think it was helped a lot by the user experience. We think a lot of that came down to enhanced mobile experience, especially for the on-site scheduling. Had improved integration with surveys and presentations. Enhanced staff functionality. As far as building support and for UX in your organization, what I found and worked with others on is that's when you're involving your key stakeholders from the start of the process. If they feel that they have a bit of ownership for that, it cuts down for a lot of things that are going to be pushed back later on. Also, when you're going out and building UX within your organization, having in-house success stories about how it's worked, um, if you don't have any, especially when starting out, it's good to have external stories that show how things can work well. And making others aware of the process and what's involved raises the standing. That's why I think it's important, even though that what we do is web, oftentimes we have, a, uh, especially on a team where I work, we're often printing out parts of the process and showing it up here inside our lab areas to let people know what's going on and what's involved in the process. It makes them understand the process better. And then even with government initiatives, over in the US, we have the US Digital Service. I know, especially when it comes down to other members of the EU have similar initiatives that show a lot of things about how you can improve the, uh, a lot of the user experience, especially for government and public facing projects. And of course, empathize that what helps the user ultimately helps you. Uh, Tim Cook of Apple basically, I think, sums it up very well as oftentimes we're looking on our own goals and not what our users' goals should be. And that's why we exist. Um, as far as organizational research, most of these are coming out here for resources are American-based, but there are international uh, counterparts as well. And of course, we have Drupal.org. I'm trying to look on getting into more user experience-focused things on there, but also then when it comes down to Stack Exchange and even LinkedIn and local events often help with this. Uh, additional reading, these are a few sources I would recommend. Uh, I think they've been a great help. And thank you for the opportunity to present today. Oh, sure. I can go ahead and I can place this deck up here anyway. Any questions? Sure. Uh, when you're doing this uh, user experience improvement, yes. are you doing follow-ups with analytics? So like checking, for example, do people drop out on checkout pages or stuff like that? When we can, we will. I know for this there was a challenge because we, it wasn't all of, for the UXPA International site, for example, it was an all volunteer team. So we started paying attention to that. And also, I was just showing it out to people at times on a limited budget for Gorilla UX. I would ask people I would know, for example, even in the family or so, to go out and test user flows at times. And it's, what's kind of interesting is even though we were working with a group that are user experience professionals, they often don't even apply their practice to their own work.
Yes. Uh, how do you find buy-in for information architecture in terms of who gets the final say? Say, like you go through an organization's content says you should really reorganize it, but then the departments might look and say, no, 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 that's not how we do it. So, like, because you'd look at it, you'd want to oh, be yes. more user facing, and they look at it and they're in their silos of, well, this is how our business process works, and that makes sense to us. So, I guess I'm asking, like, who wins that fight, or how do you win the fight? I know what you're talking about because I worked in organizations, even other projects I've been on before, they would have a high-end design firm come in, design a beautiful information architecture, but of course, as you were th talking about, especially in nonprofits, I find people are fighting for their empires, almost like university departments. Sometimes, I mean, you have to go with what you have, but I find, of course, especially in organizations that are more results driven, like when it comes down to bottom line or registration, if you actually have uh, statistics to back up why you're doing things a certain way, why there's less card abandonment, why your funnel is working. When you start putting that in front of people, it can settle a lot of arguments. Well, thank you.